story so far. Mass refers to how much stuff a thing contains. Weight refers to the rate at which that amount of stuff is being accelerated towards the Earth. In other words, weight is just another way of saying force of gravity. An object's mass never varies, but its weight can go up or down depending on the force of gravity acting on it in various parts of the universe. And now, work. These barbells have a mass of 120 kilograms. Since they are resting on the surface of the planet Earth, we know that the force of gravity acting on them is about 10 times that number of Newtons. It takes a very strong man to lift something that weighs so much. Because if the barbell is being pulled down by a force of 1,200 Newtons, it must take 1,200 Newtons of force to hold it up. Of course, if we were on the moon, where the force of gravity is only one-sixth that of the Earth, anybody can do it. But we're not on the moon. Hmm, that looks like hard work. But how much work? 1,200 Newtons worth? To lift the barbell? Mm, how far? Exactly two meters. Mm. But what if you only lifted the barbell half that distance, say, one meter? Surely that doesn't take as much work as lifting the barbell two meters. When you lift the barbell all the way up, you're doing 1,200 newtons times two meters worth of work. When you lift it only halfway up, you're doing half that amount of work. 1,200 newtons times one meter. In fact, this is how you measure work in physics. Work equals force times distance. Here you're doing 1,200 newton meters of work. Um. And here you're doing 2,400 newton meters of work. That's simple enough. Hey. But suppose that after the show, the strong man <laughs> discovers that his car is stuck in the mud. He pushes it and pushes it, but it won't budge a millimeter. And suppose that at the very same time, the clown, who hasn't got a car, is in the act of picking up the telephone to call a cab. Which of them would you say is doing work at this particular moment? The strong man or the clown? The clown. Because work equals force times distance. And although the telephone receiver only weighs about two newtons, while the strong man's car weighs perhaps 15,000 newtons, when he lifts the telephone receiver, the clown is applying a force of two newtons through a distance of 50 centimeters, let's say, or half a meter. And therefore, he's doing two newtons times half a meter of work, which is one newton meter of work. The strong man, on the other hand, may be exerting thousands of newtons of force, but since the car is not moving, there's no distance involved, and the poor man isn't doing any work at all. A force of even thousands of newtons times zero distance equals zero work, whereas a force of only two newtons through a distance of only half a meter does equal some work, even if it's only one newton meter worth. But it's a bit awkward to keep on talking about newton meters of work. So physicists have borrowed the name of a famous British scientist, James Prescott Joule, as the measure of work. One joule is the amount of work done when one newton of force is applied through a distance of one meter. That's to say that one newton meter equals one joule, which can also be written like this. So the clown did one joule of work when he lifted the telephone receiver. And the strong man did 2,400 joules of work when he lifted the barbell. But of course, when he tries to move his car, it's a different story. He does zero joules of work. Eureka! The story so far.
stationary things don't want to move. It takes a force to move them. Force equals mass times acceleration and is measured in newtons. When a force moves something through a distance, work is done. Work is measured in joules. One joule is the amount of work done when one newton of force is applied through a distance of one meter. And now, kinetic energy. Because of inertia or laziness, this billiard ball doesn't want to move. In fact, it would sit there all day minding its own business if another ball were not to come along and knock it into the pocket. Because the second ball forces the first one to move. Whenever you have a force acting through a distance, you know that some work has been done. Fine. But where did this work come from? The second billiard ball, naturally. But what's so special about this ball that enables it to push the other one around? They both have the same mass, don't they? And they're both being pulled down to Earth by exactly the same force of gravity. So what did the second ball have that the first ball didn't? Movement. It was moving and the other one wasn't. And when you have both mass and speed, you have the ability to do work. You can use your movement to get other things to move. In a sense, you have work in you. Physicists, keen as ever on borrowing words from other languages, went this time to Greek and found that the Greek word for in is en and that the word for work is ergon. When you put en and ergon together, you get energon, which comes out as the English word energy. And the physicists agreed to use this word to mean the ability to do work. So the moving billiard ball had energy. The origin of this energy was, of course, the billiard player, whose arm had work in it, or energy, because of its movement. This energy was transferred to the cue when the arm made the cue move, which in turn transferred the energy to the billiard ball by making it move and hit the other ball, forcing it to move into the billiard table pocket. In each case, a number of joules of work were done. Arm moving cue, cue moving ball, ball moving ball. But since work is merely energy in action, and there's no work possible without energy, we might as well say that a number of joules of energy were expended each time. And that's exactly what we do say. Both work and energy are measured in joules. Think of joules being transferred from an energy box to a work box, and then to a force times distance box. Joules of energy are spent not only by billiard players, but by hockey players and soccer players, carpenters and ditch diggers. And all the energy to do all this work is only made possible by movement. So that they wouldn't forget this, the physicists went once again to their Greek dictionaries and found that the Greek for movement is kinema, a word that film producers have also borrowed to mean moving pictures or cinema. But the physicists decided to keep the K and to call the energy of movement kinetic energy. The story so far. Things which are moving have the ability to do work and to apply a force through a distance. They can be said to have work in them. Another word for work in 
is energy. Since energy is simply the ability to do work, and since work is measured in joules, energy is also measured in joules. The energy of movement is called kinetic energy. And now, potential energy. Once upon a time, a very small man had to do battle with a very large giant. The only thing that the small man had going for him was his sling. When he let loose with it, the mass of the stone combined with its speed to give it kinetic energy with which it was able to do work on the giant, thereby applying force and exerting that force through a distance. The stone had energy thanks to its movement. Indeed, everything that moves has energy, even the air around us. Once air is moving, it has the energy to drive windmills. Just as when water is moving, it has the energy to drive water mills. But if every moving thing has kinetic energy, does that mean that things which aren't moving don't have energy? In that case, why are you staring up at that rock perched on the edge of the cliff? Why be frightened of it? It can't have any kinetic energy because it's not moving. And if it hasn't any kinetic energy, it can't do any work on you, can it? But maybe you'd better move out of the way all the same. Why? Because of the rock's position on the edge of the cliff. It hasn't any movement so far, but it looks as if it's on the point of having quite a lot of movement any minute now. Because the force of gravity wants very much to make it fall off the cliff. That means that in a sense, the rock has a lot of energy stored up in it. A lot of what scientists call potential energy. Or the energy of position. The slightest puff of wind and that potential energy will immediately start being transformed into kinetic energy. That's how the energy of position becomes the energy of movement. Uh-oh, don't look now. But it's time to use some more kinetic energy to do some more work on that giant. Whoops, hold on. What's happening? Let's do that again in slow motion. The stone lost more and more speed as it left your sling because of the force of gravity trying to pull it down. The higher it got, the slower it went and the less kinetic energy it had. Until at last it came to a complete stop and had no kinetic energy left in it at all. And therefore, no work in it and no force that it could exert on the giant. But where did all that kinetic energy go? Is it lost forever? No, it's being transformed into potential energy. The work that the little man put into slinging the stone is now stored up in the stone. But of course, in reality, the stone only stops for a split second and then immediately starts coming down again until it has got back all the kinetic energy that it had in the first place. Meanwhile, back at the cliff edge, the giant finds all this very amusing. But he'd better watch out because most of the kinetic energy it took for him to climb up to the top of the cliff is now stored in him by virtue of his position. He's full of potential energy, just waiting to be converted back into kinetic energy any minute now. Timber! Well, fuck your mother and mother, young sister.